have to, I, I have a tendency to move around, but I'm supposed to just stand here, so I would just, maybe somebody can like make faces at me if I start uh, not doing that. So thank you so much for having me, especially uh, for coming out at the very last, in the very last week. I'm sure your brains are all tired, so hopefully it won't be too boring. Um, it's been really great being here as a Rachel Carson Simona Weil Fellow. Um, I had to come in May and then I came back, which is, it's, so it's probably my fault that we actually haven't met yet because I was gone in between. Um, yeah, and I, I do work on memory activism. I can talk that, about that later. And activism somehow plays a role also in, in what I'll talk about today, but um, I, I can, of course, in the Q&A talk more about it if you like. So uh, what I do want to talk about today is the memory politics and culture of remembering extinct species and biodiversity loss as a way of, sort of thinking through the challenge of slow memory. And I'll tell you more about what I think slow memory means in a minute, um, but that'll work. Yeah. Um, but first, let me just say a little bit about the framework within which I've been thinking about this, which is that um, I've been leading a four-year EU-funded project um, called a Cost Action, which is a really weird um, EU funding mechanism that I won't go into because it would probably take me the whole time to explain how it works. Uh, but again, I can talk about it later if you're interested. Um, but it's basically network funding. So we've got members from over 40 countries and over 220 individual members. <coughs> and we're sort of coming together to figure out what, what slow memory might mean. So, you know, you probably won't get the definitive answer today because we're only about halfway through. And the other thing that I've been doing is that I've been engaging with and studying a project on the Isle of Dorset, uh, Portland. Uh, on, sorry, uh, um, Isle of Dorset, on the Dorset coast, so in southern England, the Isle of Portland, uh, which is not to be confused with the one in Portland, in, in Oregon or Maine, but actually it's been in the news in the last few days, I don't know if you saw, but the UK government has decided to, to park a really big barge there to house asylum seekers, uh, which the UN has, has criticized as violating international law. And so the community has, has you know, protested, but mostly sort of in the sense of we, we want these people to be safe and not on a prison ship. Um, so there are lots of layers to this island that I could talk about, but unfortunately I don't have time today. So I've been, I've been sort of working with these activists who are trying to build a memorial to extinct species. And that's really shaped uh, my own thinking about the concept. So I usually, I'm a memory scholar, so I usually talk to people who kind of know what memory studies means and who have no idea about environmental issues, more or less. So it's a bit flipped today. So I don't know, I'll, I hope I've pitched this right for you. Um, so memory studies at its core is uh, about understanding how the past is made meaningful in the present, right? And it's really helped us as a field to think about in particular, how sudden and extreme and sort of distinct events, right? So wars, atrocities, genocide, but also positive things like revolutions and, and triumphs, right? How, how those kinds of things shape our identities. And those are the sorts of things that we set in stone, right? Both states and activists work on that. And there's always a contentious process around what we set in stone. Um, and one of the sort of sometimes only implicit assumptions of memory studies is that the past can kind of save us, right? That, that the lessons of the past will help avoid us make mistakes in the future and, and shape our behavior in the future. Now that's, you know, whether or not this is actually always the case, that's an empirical question, but let's for now assume that, that there's something to this idea. Um, but memory studies and, and also to some extent memory policies um, have been much less adept at helping us grapple with um, less extreme past, right? More gradual, less eventful kinds of developments. Um, so the question is, if memory helps us make sense of the past in, in order to shape our present and our future, how do we do this with slow things? Um, so we're increasingly recognizing right, that, that gradual developments are important to us today. So this is not just an intellectual problem, but it's really a practical run, one, right? So when the past is slow, uh, when the slowness of the change or the development that we're, that we, we're needing to address is harder to address um, than, than eventful past within 24-hour news cycles and election cycles, how can we actually translate that past into, into some sort of actionable um, you know, behavior or policy in the present? Um, so we've been thinking about uh, what slow memory studies would have to look like and sort of thinking about three um, entangled areas. One is what kinds of past 
we should be addressing and seeing as relevant in, in memory studies and how that should shape our theories of, of you know, uh, how, how people make sense of the past. And I just want to emphasize that slow here isn't, isn't really meant as a temporal adjective strictly, but really as sort of, sort of a short, shorthand for the impact on our lives um, that can be gradual, unspectacular, without a clear beginning or end, you know, unsighted, multi-sighted, or seemingly kind of agentless. So slow memory is a concept that tries to capture the historical and contemporary, contemporary memory politics surrounding hard to pin down developments, it's a technical term, um, that, has, that have profound impact on our lives. So that's kind of the first thing, right? How do we deal with slow things? The second is, what kinds of memory practices are we interested in? And memory practices can happen at different tempos, but uh, we've been talking about the fact that memory studies has been really paying much less attention to slow practices of remembrance um, because it often doesn't even recognize them as, as types of remembrance. And the third thing is that we have been thinking about the academic field of memory studies as something we want to be doing with less time pressure. And this, maybe unsurprisingly, is, is probably the least controversial part of what we've been doing because it seems like everybody is so fed up with time pressure and um, you know, like having to have these measurable outcomes and demonstrating impact and all these kinds of, obviously that's not uh, limited to memory studies at all, it's academia in general, right? Um, so I think the fact that our action has grown so quickly has a lot to do with that. Um, but it's, so it's partly that we want to stop ourselves from burning out, that we want to take care of each other better in an academic community, um, but also that we think we, you know, we kind of need to slow down in order to see and listen to the things that are happening and then to be able to take urgent action. So it's not at all about you know, slowing down and not doing anything. It's about really taking things in in a way that allows you to take the right action. And I think that's actually what, I, this has a lot to do with um, Christoph's idea of slow hope, right? Um, there's a lot of overlap there, I think. So I'm not gonna focus on the last bit today, but mostly on the, on the first two. Um, so one reason the idea of slowness appeals to a lot of people and why temporality has become a hot topic, not just in memory studies, but you know, all kinds of different fields, is that there's a strong sense that we're experiencing a moment of acceleration right now. Uh, and that is, of course, especially evident in environmental uh, concerns with the environmental crisis. And I, so I think this, this uh, sort of uh, being enamored or being interested in slowness uh, might be explained by the fact that the sort of quintessential gradual but potentially devastating development, which is climate change, has now actually become eventful, right? The extreme, I mean, right now, it's in the news, top headlines every day, right? These extreme weather events that we're all dealing with mean that at least some portion, a pretty big portion probably, of the population is now acutely aware of this change that has been gradual um, and, and that the fact that it's been slowly happening without us paying attention <coughs> So we're having sort of an easier time paying attention to this gradual slow past because it stopped being slow, right? Um, although, of course, we should be thinking about how we're implicated in the events that are happening right now into the distant future, or distant past and into the distant future as well. Um, so let me just turn to the main issue I'm addressing today which is how we collectively remember species extinction as a slow past. So I think this is quite interesting to think about in relation to slow memory for a few reasons. First, extinction is a phenomenon that alerts us to the continuity of fundamental processes, right? Because background extinctions are of course always happening and it's a matter of everyday life. It's quite unspectacular in many ways, especially you know, from a human perspective. But past mass extinction events, take us into deep time. And they are a past that can be found in the fossil record, and so it alerts us to the importance of geology for memory, right? of, of sort of seeing rocks as a record of life on Earth. Um, and the current six ex extinction, mass extinction event is different, though, of course, because it's caused, been caused by human action, and it's not that old, right? It's actually crazily fast, if you think about it from a geological um, time perspective, um, so we don't even really have to go into deep time to think about it, right? Even if you start it from, or you date it from the beginning of agriculture, but of course this extinction event really picks up with the era of modern state building and um, accelerates then even more with um, 
sort of with the middle of the 20th century. So that's actually crazy fast, right, if you think about uh, how scientists would, would define a mass extinction event. And despite this very, very fast development, the current mass extinction is not getting nearly as much attention as climate change uh, has at least begun to get now. Uh, and you only need to compare the um, sort of coverage, news coverage of the UN conferences on climate change versus the ones on biodiversity, the Convention of Biological Diversity, right? It's a really stark difference, even though, of course, the two topics actually can't be separated. So I would argue that this is because climate change has become eventful and spectacular, whereas species, species extinction has not, of course, again, from a human perspective, um, right? We can still ignore ecosystems breaking down. So the question is, how do we respond to this with cultural memory? <clears throat> so if the core purpose of remembrance practices is to make any past, whether it's sudden or gradual or violent or joyful, meaningful in the present, there's always sort of a process of reducing the complexity of that past into some sort of symbolic form. Mm. But histories that have unfolded gradually or unspectacularly are all the more challenging to translate into something that is concrete and sort of experiential and actionable, right, in the policy. So what becomes clear is that when faced with a temporal disconnect that hampers a slow past from gaining traction, activists and policymakers have a couple of choices. The first is that they could make use of conventional and easily recognizable memory tools, what I call fast memory, right? Make, let's make an anniversary day, let's build a memorial, that kind of thing. Um, so either they can do that uh, in an attempt to translate a slow past into something that is denoted as significant uh, within the temporality that corresponds to our dominant modes of interaction, right? So we understand, okay, that means it's important somehow for us. Or the other option is that they can use slow memory techniques as a way to adjust our social and political relationships to the temporality of the past that we're trying to grapple with, or at least kind of get closer to that, uh, to that temporality. So what I want to argue is that um, the sixth mass extinction so far has been addressed mainly as a matter of individualized loss in terms of human mourning, and as a result is really uh, kind of addressed with fast memory, fast memory techniques. So this, what I call the dominant memory culture of extinction, is very much evident in natural history museums, which I've kind of been uh, visiting all around the world. Um, uh, so the natural history museum, for the most part, they spotlight individual stories and charismatic creatures, even kind of fetishizing some of the specimens that they have. And this is also reflected in their commercial operations, so you can buy a dodo t-shirt, right? <coughs> um, but there's really not very much information about the broader causes and processes that have led to extinction. And of course, there are some exceptions to this. Some, some museums do a better job than others. Um, but we see some examples of this here, right? So uh, commemorating the dodo or the thylacine, the Tasmanian uh, tiger. Most of these museums don't inform the visitor about their own origins. This is almost nothing about their own history, usually, in these museums and their own implicatedness in biodiversity loss. Even though, of course, the field of natural science with, it, with uh, which these museums are intimately entangled and the study of biodiversity and species, right, this whole idea of extinction, of course, and research general, right, is very much linked to the history of imperialism and colonialism. Uh, and so, not coincidentally, the era of exploration and the beginnings of memorializing extinct species is also the era of development, the development of national memory cultures with all its tools of building memorials and museums, including natural history museums. So natural history museums are thus direct products of the idea that the world, especially the non-European kind of exotic world, needs to be classified and studied and exhibited. And at the same time, this drive for exploration directly led to the extinction of many of the species that are now memorialized in these museums. So, in a way, this individualistic approach, right, sort of focusing on particular uh, species makes a lot of sense because it allows the museums to stay silent about their own historical responsibility. It also, though, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, right, I also think it makes sense from the perspective of a genuine desire of a lot of people who work at these museums, which, you know, a lot of them are, of course, committed environmentalists today. 
uh, it sort of makes sense uh, as a way to draw people in and inform them about biodiversity loss um, based on this assumption that you know people kind of connect to individual species, right? This is what Ursula Heise was talking about uh, when she referred to the proxy logic of, um, of, of particular species, right? To inform people about biodiversity. And it also addresses what Rob Nixon talks about in his, his book about slow violence, that there's this real problem of representing slow violence, so you need to kind of bridge that, right? So I think the museums, right, they're complicated places that kind of do both. Uh, so I'm not criticizing fast memory as such. I think it's actually really important uh, for, uh, for us to sort of um, bring attention to slow pass, but there's certainly a lot of uh, limitations and problems to it. So let me now finally get to my main case. So my main case study, the MEMO project, the Mass Extinction Memorial Observatory um, on the Isle of Portland, is um, a, a project that I think in many ways latches onto this memory culture of extinction, but it also has the potential to go beyond it. And I've been engaging with it with sort of the last two years. So I'll just show you. So that's, that's where it is. That's where the barge has now landed. It's this little island in southern England on the Jurassic Coast. It was started in about 2007, the project, uh, by a stonemason called Sebastian Brook, who had been commissioned to uh, make a, a stone sculpture of a Spix macaw, uh, uh, which I believe was extinct in the wild at the time. And he, he wasn't an environmentalist or anything. He was just like, started learning about this topic because he was commissioned to do this. And he suddenly had this sort of crazy moment of recognition and, and thought, why are we talk not talking about this every day? This is crazy, right? This is a real crisis. And so as a stonemason, his reaction was, well, let's build a memorial. Let's set in stone the species we've already lost to mark them as important. Um, so the, the memorial, again, it's not built yet, but it's going to be, uh, hopefully, if they, if they manage to do it, on the Isle of Portland, uh, which has a long history of stone quarrying and mining going back to the Romans. So it's a very popular building stone. Uh, and that coast, the Jurassic Coast, it's called that, uh, and it has been uh, designated by the UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. It's the only natural World Her Heritage Site in Great Britain. And it, the designation was for its contribution to earth science investigations for over 300 years. So this is because the fossils found in, at the, on the Jurassic Coast, and in particular in Portland Stone, were actually directly connected to the science of extinction, right, to developing the concept of extinction. Robert Hooke, who uh, was the surveyor of London after the Great Fire of London, so when they had to rebuild London, Portland Stone was kind of in as a building material, and he saw the fossils in the stone, including these giant ammonites, and that's how he kind of figured out and then gave lots of lectures saying, guys, you know, this is a thing. Um, extinction is a thing. So the location of the planned memorial on Portland right, provides this direct historical link to the development of natural, natural sciences and also this era of, of imperialism and exploration and to the creation of the biodiversity crisis itself. So that's uh, Sebastian explaining. Uh, that's where the memorial is going to be. You can see it's on the cliff side. And that is a, a computer-generated image of what the memorial is supposed to look like. So, um, so I think even though Sebastian's motivation for Memo was that he really wanted to call attention to biodiversity loss as a global problem, and you know he realized this is obviously this this problem doesn't have a place, but Portland is a good place to to talk about this. Um, so it's very much you know, what we've been talking about as a, as a slow thing, but he's actually chosen the very conventional fast memory tool, right? Um, building a big memorial. So uh, Portland Stone itself is very much linked to our conventional understanding of mem memorialization. First of all, it's used all the time for gravestones. So you can see those are some gravestones on the island, some old ones, but it's still used for that purpose. Uh, and as I said, it's used for monumental buildings in downtown London, so St. Paul's Cathedral is made of Portland Stone, and the UN headquarters in New York City are clad with Portland Stone. Uh, similarly, um, you know, the idea of building a big, big old memorial, first of all, it's designed by a very famous architect, David Ajay. He 
um, uh, designed the Museum for African American History and Culture in Washington DC and a bunch of other things. He's now very famous. When he made this design, he was not as well known and so you know, he did it for not very much money. Um, so that's a thing, like let's get a, let's get a big architect to do this, right? <clears throat> and then there's the design of the memorial itself. Um, so here you can see how it's supposed to look from the inside. It's a spiral structure uh, based or inspired by the giant ammonite. And um, so the idea is to carve extinct species um, sort of chronologically in this, in this um, spiral based on the IUCN Red List. Um, and the, the, uh, an early memo project uh, brochure noted, the spirit of the carvings will be one of exquisite delight in the particularity of each creature represented. At the size described from the center of the enclosure, the carvings will become a pattern, a grid, a statistic. But seen up close, they will be intimate and individual beauty. Right? So this is, this is the idea for the memorial. So this idea, right, setting in stone chronologically these species um, and putting them next to each other uh, is actually a very traditional way to memorialize, right? You set them next to each other sort of as a sign of their equality and sacrifice, right? Whether they're a private or an officer or a charismatic megafauna or a, an insect, right? And there's also this idea, right, of where they talk about this is, you represent the enormity of the loss by having some sort of sense of uh, how many creatures have gone extinct, uh, right? You sort of present this endless list of names, right? Think Vietnam Veterans Memorial or something like that. Um, and at the same time, you're trying to bring some dignity and individuality back to the victims. <clears throat> so it's very conventional in many ways, right? And yet there's um, the motto, oh, there we go, there's uh, one of the carved species. Um, but the motto of the memo project, to explore biodiversity, the, the threat of mass extinction, and what it means to be humans, human, also points to that larger connection to a more slow memory approach. So right at the outset, so in 2007, it was really apparently quite a surprise, right? Because this guy was totally unknown, had no resources, but immediately he got a lot of support, support including from the Royal Society, um, as well as, and this is you know, important if you're in England, um, Prince Philip became the royal patron and he hosted two fundraising dinners at Buckingham Palace, so it doesn't get much better than that in the UK. Um, E.O. Wilson was an early supporter, as is um, Michael Bloomberg, and then also sort of the global um, environmental scene. So in 2010, the project was presented at the UN Summit on Biodiversity, and then again at COP15 last December where I got to go along and, and help uh, present the project. So there's all this sort of high level support and buzz, and yet the project just hasn't gotten off the ground. And so this is kind of the puzzle that I'm dealing with at the moment, right? So I think one of the fundamental reasons has to do with the fact that the need to remember extinct species is still relatively abstract and remains a peripheral concern for most people. So it's this perceived slowness, right? This lack of being spectacular. Uh, and in a way, it's also the fact that it focuses on the past. So a lot of uh, the sort of people who've been approached for support have said, yeah, but it's really gloomy, right? Who wants to go um, you know, up to one of these cliffs and like, just see all these species that we can't do anything about anymore, right? They're all gone. So it's, it's really kind of dark and depressing. Who wants to do that? Um, so the activists then kind of shifted gear. And what they did, uh, whoops was to partner with the Eden Project. I don't know if many people here are familiar with the Eden Project. Um, it's kind of a botanical garden slash environmental theme park in, in Cornwall. But uh, Sir Tim Smith, who, who pioneered that project, he uh, had this idea with that, that he would go into an economically deprived area. Right? He, it's an old clay mine. And he went in and really you know, built this big tourist attraction, essentially, um, and really revitalized the local economy. Um, and it's now got, you know, I don't know how many millions of visitors, and it's also become a sort of, it's, it's probably one of the most important tourist attractions in the UK, and also it's uh, become sort of a, a national symbol. So during the Queen's Jubilee um, celebrations, and also the King's Coronation Concert, that was featured alongside, you know, Big Ben and Tower of London and so on. And here's proof of that, that that was the, uh, coronation concert, which is also, 
embarrassingly, embarrassingly proof that I watched the coronation concert, <laughs> but it's only for scientific purposes, of course. Um, right, so that argument about economic revitalization, you know, unsurprisingly has gotten the attention of local business leaders and the local council, um, because Portland is very deprived. It has very, very um, you know, bad statistics in terms of um, suicide rates and job rates and all that stuff. Um, so there's now sort of a new plan where they want to raise money from donors, from government, but also borrow money sort of on the, based on the prowess of the Eden Project as a big global player now. And it's all premised on the idea, on the importance not of biodiversity loss or environmental crisis, right, or mourning extinct species, some, you know, something that has to do with memory, but really on revitalizing the economy and creating jobs. Um, so the first stage <coughs> would be um, a sort of, basically they've gotten an underground mine um, from a, a stone company, so they'll, they'll hand over one of their mines that they're done with, and they're going to create this sort of really cool underground multimedia experience that you know, will be a fun day out. Like that you want to attract people to come and have a day on the Isle of Portland, and sort of on the way you learn something about biodiversity and, and dinosaurs and things like that. That's, I've been in the mine a few times now, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and so that's the idea, right? You come, and that, this is the concept of the Eden Project, is that they call it education by stealth. So you come because you want to have a fun day, but you learn something without really noticing about uh, envi the environment. And that is kind of how it's uh, meant to work. And so this is going to be the first stage. Oops. Yeah. And um, the, in the second stage, what they want to do is with the funding that goes in from the first stage, they want to start building this memorial sort of in that spiral structure gradually uh, by restarting a stone masonry program that had been discontin discontinued, sort of like they used to build cathedrals, right? You build on site and you can see how the thing's being built. And so that building and sort of working with the rock will be become part of the tourist attraction itself. So in a way, I'm wondering whether, you know, this might be memory by stealth, right? You get people to come, um, but you also kind of create a space for them to remember and to mourn maybe these, these species. Uh, and in addition, I think there's something about bringing people into the mine, right? So I, as I said, I've been there a few times now. And there are these big cracks on the ceiling. So when you go in the first time, you're obviously a little worried, right? What's up with that crack? And somebody inevitably always asks about it. You know, is it really safe? And the mine manager then says, actually, yeah, because that, that crack is this many millions of years old. And it was actually created when the Pyrenees were thrown, thrown up. Right? That's what it tells you about the connection here. And I think there's something about that, right? Um, that you know you could go into the space and get a sense of deep time and also about the importance of our action sort of into the into the distant future right into a future that we can't really imagine um, yeah and, and you know it's, it's also maybe a place where they could start talking about how our sense of or a lack of ability to grapple with these different temporalities is part of the problem right that we can't actually imagine are um, what our impact is going to have in the long term. So you might be wondering why I have a pair of old shoes on my concluding slide. It's because it kind of gave me a bit of an epiphany about slow memory. Because I was interviewing Seb Brook. These are his, his shoes, um, obviously very run down. And he kind of looked down at them and he's like, yeah, that's, that's uh, 150 million years old um, stone dust on my shoes. Right? So he's been wearing these shoes while he's been carving stone and then you know doing fundraising events and trying to persuade people to support this project for like the last 15 16 years all while you know trying to raise kids and really never having any money right and and really trying to eat, uh, make ends meet and so on so the shoes really show that wear and tear of a human effort to do this and i think you know it 15 years that might not register at all in geological terms uh, but it certainly is a long time for a human uh, who's trying to get a project like this off the ground. So slow memory for me means not only taking into account, you know, sort of the big questions about deep time or slow moving change, but how these interact with contemporary human struggles and experience. So I will leave it at that and look forward to the discussion.